two committees, uh, House Natural and Senate Natural, where uh, it's a joint meeting, uh, and we're here to welcome Dr. Mark Anderson to speak with us today. Um, so it's great news that he's been willing to travel up here and provide a presentation to help us look at uh, climate issues uh, on a planning level, and particularly when we have a lot of work to do across a broad landscape. So uh, I thought we would start with uh, introductions from committee members. So how about if we... Good morning, I'm uh, Jim McCullough. I represent the brave little hamlet of Williston, and I do serve on the House Natural Commission. Uh, Matt Hill uh, from the Wall 2, which is uh, Johnson Hyde Park, Wolcott and Belvedere, also on Natural Resources. I'm William Morgan, I represent Grand Isle County and the western portion of Milton, which is in Chittenden County, and I'm on Natural Resources, Fish and Wildlife also. Amy Sheldon, I represent Middlebury, and I chair the House Natural Resources Committee. Uh, Chris Bray, I represent the Addison Senate District and chair Natural Resources on the Senate side. Good morning, Brian Campion, uh, State Senator for Bennington County and uh, the town of Wilmington. Corey Parent, State Senator for Franklin County and Albert. Okay. So, uh, you want to say a little something before we go? I, I, I don't have, actually need to say too much, so I think we could get started and introduce Heather Furman, who's the State Director here in Vermont for the Nature Conservancy. Welcome, Heather. Hey. Uh, uh, Chair Bray, Chair Sheldon, thank you so much for co-hosting this um, presentation with sure. us. And thank you to all the committee members and, and our friends and partners who are in the room and for taking the time to be here. I also want to take this moment to thank you all for your support of the Vermont Housing Conservation Board and the funding that is so critical to the work that we do every day. Um, we had a full state house yesterday. It speaks volumes about how deeply Vermonters care about our natural resources and all of the benefits that they provide. So before I dive in and introduce Dr. Mark Anderson to you, let me share a little bit about the Nature Conservancy for those of you who don't know. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is currently the largest uh, environmental organization in the world. We are in 79 countries and in all 50 states. Here in Vermont, our little Vermont chapter has been at it for 60 years. We're celebrating our 60th anniversary this year. Uh, we have helped to conserve over 300,000 acres in the state of Vermont and have protected some of our most iconic areas, natural areas, including Green River Reservoir and Campbell's Hump State Park. We've also contributed thousands of acres to our wildlife management areas uh, for all Vermonters to enjoy. Um, but today, the Nature Conservancy is really laser focused on solving some of our biggest environmental challenges. And what drives us and what gets me up every day is our science and the ways in which our science informs our on the ground protection and drives our policies that can lead to, to greater change. So I don't need to tell anyone in this room about the demands that the public have for our, our leaders to take action on climate change, to take action on water quality, and to help our communities become more resilient. So this morning, Mark is gonna present a body of work that is more than just science. It's, for us, a roadmap and a vision, what I think that we desperately need in this state, for securing a network of protected and connected climate resilient lands that give nature a fighting chance to move and adapt as the climate changes and continue providing all of the services that we need from nature. The science is absolutely clear. Those lands that are intact, biologically diverse, and connected for wildlife are also those lands that provide the services that we need, purifying our air and water, storing carbon, and absorbing our floodwaters. So let me just introduce, by way of background, Dr. Mark Anderson. He is currently the Nature Conservancy's Director of Conservation Science for the Eastern United States. He's worked as an ecologist for over 30 years, 27 of those proudly with the Nature Conservancy. He holds a PhD in ecology from the University of New Hampshire and publishes regularly on climate change, 
large landscape conservation, biodiversity, and forest dynamics. He received the Conservancy's Distinguished Conservation Achievement Award in 2017. He serves on the board of the Northeast Wilderness Trust, and he manages an amazing team of scientists in our Austin office. A few years ago, as Mark's work began to take shape, he was asked to replicate this science for the entire United States. And with the support of the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, he has just recently completed a map that you will see today of our resilience analysis for the entire US. Later this year, we will be rolling this out to our partners, um, and we are working closely with government agencies. So you're really among the first to see this ground science, and it's been uh, just wonderful to watch Mark's work evolve within the Conservancy and with our partners. And so I am absolutely delighted to introduce Dr. Mark Anderson. Thank you. Heather, for that nice introduction, thank you for having me come up. I'm really excited to be here and to present this. As Heather said, it's the US, the whole US part is hot off the press, so we're just getting used to it. But what I really like you to see is how is the concepts we've been working on for about over a decade, really, and how Vermont really fits into the picture. So I'm going to emphasize that. Um, I'm not going to say, I, I want you to know that we have been, we started this project 12 years ago. We never envisioned it going national. But over the course of that 12 years, we've had over 150 scientists engaged in working on this in steering committees across the country. And they were both TNC scientists and outside scientists. Um, and I really want to highlight, too, there's two uh, women who are on my staff who are just amazing spatial analysts who've done a lot of the mapping you'll see. Um, and I'm not going to say much more crediting to people. I'm going to bomb through this <laughs> so that you get the big picture. And I'm not going to give all the credits where everything's due. So I just want you to know that there's a, been a lot of people working on this. And it's been, we have 11 peer-reviewed papers out. We have reports out. You know, so we've really been trying to keep this very transparent and public and built on the soundest science we could come up with. So I'll start with the, the bad news is, you know, we are clearly in the middle of a climate crisis and an abundance crisis. Last year, the news was very, a, a global report came out from IUCN uh, documenting the severe decline of animals and plants around the world. And it was followed in September by an article in Science uh, that, that looked at North America and documented a decline in our birds, 29% decline. Uh, Three billion less birds in the country than in 1970. There was one very interesting piece of this article that I want to point out. These are all the declining habitats, but there was one habitat where birds have actually been increasing, and that was our wetlands. And the reason for the increase is due to two things. Better regulations on harvesting and management of waterfowl, and billions of dollars spent on restoration and protection. So one of the take home messages is, restoration and protection really works to reverse this kind of trend. That got us thinking a lot. However, Restoration and protection is a little different now because under a climate change, our natural world is moving and rearranging. Our own government FIA, uh, Forest Inventory and Analysis, has shown that our tree populations, trees, <laughs> you know, have sh the distribution of them have shifted on average about 10 miles northward per decade and 11 miles west per decade. And that, those shifts are due to changes in moisture and temperature. So things that were limited, it was too dry or too cold, have, they're now establishing you know, young trees into those areas. And maybe in other parts of their uh, range, they're dying out where it's gotten too hot or too wet. So how do you do conservation? You know, all of our conservation previously was sort of based on where things are now. <laughs> and we didn't think a lot about where they're going to be in the future or how they're going to move. And that's really been a lot of the work that we've been focusing on. So as Heather said, in the Nature Conservancy, we've reinvested in 
conserving land and water. It's come roaring back as a strategy that is central to conserving diversity and people under climate change. And we've set a vision that we call conserving resilient land and water to conserve a network of resilient sites and connecting corridors that will allow nature to adapt to climate change and thrive. And we have this mapped, spatial map, and I'm going to walk you through sort of the concepts of how we got to this map, and then we'll look at how Vermont fits in. There's three key uh, ingredients, and I'll just talk about them one by one, but so you see how they fit. Resilient sites, a permeable connected landscape, and then resilient species and systems on those sites. So the first thing is, because there's so much change, one good approach to looking at, at uh, conservation planning is to think about the factors that create biodiversity patterns in the first place. And a lot of those are physical factors that don't really change with climate. Things like geology, soils, topography, hydrology. Uh, and so what we've done is we've planned out, this is a map of showing you there are many, many species that are restricted to certain geology types, such as limestone, or shale, or high elevation granite, or serpentine. And those, we think those areas will continue to be important for species that are restricted to those. So we can plan out, using physical properties, a, a conservation plan that represents all the physical diversity of the world, <coughs> thinking that that will retain the biological diversity in the future. And this approach is called conserving nature's stage. And it's gotten a lot of press in the last few years because it really seems to work. But there's a lot of stages out there, you know, if you're thinking about physical stages. So the next question we dove into is, can we actually identify places that will be more resilient to climate change, that will uh, sustain diversity longer than, than another place, maybe of the same soil type? And, to, and we found that there are some interesting ways to look at that, and it has to do with microclimates and connectedness. Microclimates, you probably already know. You've noticed areas where the snow's on one side of the slope and the, you know, on the north side and the other side sunny and hot. So what you can do is you can find landscapes that have a lot of climate variation built into the landscape from the topography. And this is often 10 or 15 degrees of temperature and differences and moisture differences even larger from you know, the dry upper crest down to the basin where water collects. And if you can find places that have a lot of climate variation, species that live in those areas can actually move around on the site to find their climates as the regional climate changes. This allows them to be buffered from climate change and persist longer, maybe not forever, but much longer than places that don't have microclimates. So we spent years trying to map microclimates, but here's, here is a map of areas with high microclimates. And on this map, green is above average, yellow is average, and brown is below average. So brown would be very flat regions that don't have a lot of microclimates. And what you can see here, first of all, is Vermont has lots of microclimates built into its landscape, which makes Vermont a more resilient state than some of other states that we've been looking at. So for this whole microclimate idea to really work, species also have to be able to move around and access those microclimates. And there are things that fragment the landscape and prevent that kind of movement. So to get at that, we've developed maps of, we called it a resistance grid, like how much resistance is there to moving. And in those maps, we have all sorts of development, mining, roads, major and minor roads, transmission lines, pipelines, railroads, industrial agriculture, hay pasture, industrial forestry, energy, oil and gas. I mean, there's millions of things that actually fragment the landscape and create resistance. And our model was to find where are the places that are actually very locally connected and also have the microclimates. Here's the picture for Vermont of areas that are highly connected locally in green again. Yellow is average and brown is below average in terms of, con so the brown areas have many more of those fragmented features creating resistance. 
And then our mapping of resilient land is essentially mapping of the areas that have both, lots of microclimates in a very connected landscape. And once again, I really want to point out, Vermont has a lot of resilient land. It has lots of places where you have both microclimates and they are very well connected. And again, those places are places where species will be buffered from the effects of the regional climate. Maybe not forever, but for a long time. And the transitions will slow down, allowing things to recover and move at a more sane pace. Here's the micro, here's the resilience map for the whole country. I just have to show it off because it's so fun to see it. <laughs> you can see Vermont up in the corner, but there's places all across the country. Again, you're seeing the places across the country that have more microclimates and are more connected. Now lastly, if we did this right, I'm going to show you what is underneath the green in Vermont. And if we did this right, we represent all the different physical habitats. So here, limestone is in yellow, sedimentary rock is in tan, these granitic areas are in gray. And what you can see is that you have a very diverse landscape full of lots of different geological types, and you have resilient examples of those. You know, uh, I won't play this up today, but much more than your neighbor. <laughs> you <know? laughs> Who, in New Hampshire, I tell the Granite State would sort of die for the, that incredible limestone rich, uh, resilient limestone rich area that, that really creates a diversity. Uh, Vermont has hundreds of more species than New Hampshire, and it's coming from your, it's coming from that physical diversity. An example of how this works, you know, you can zoom into the maps, the resilient maps, you can overlay the parcel that you know, and you can see, okay, this is limestone and a little sedimentary, it's got lots of microclimates, you know, this is Equinox Highlands, you know, one great example of a resilient area. And you can see how Vermont fits into our whole eastern map. When we finished this map, you know, it was really interesting to see all the different areas that come up. And most of them we already knew about, but there's lots of new things in here too. So again, now we have this map for the whole east and the whole country of showing you where, where those different areas are with microclimates and uh, local connectedness. All right, so if you're with me, this is, this is about, that's about finding these resilient sites, places where we can do tangible, long-term conservation, and we feel good about our investments because we know those sites have those characteristics that make them more resilient. But if there are species on there and they're thriving and they're reproducing and they have offspring that are dispersing, we've got to think about how those sites connect together. And even we have to think about things might eventually be leaving those sites and looking for the next piece of limestone or the next piece of granite. So that gets us into this, how do we maintain a permeable landscape that allows those kind of dynamics? So this is a map uh, that's created for the country on, on the movements and flows that might happen if species are moving and following their climate envelopes. And what you can see in this map is there's areas like here. So the uh, pink is mammals, blue is birds, yellow is reptiles and amphibians. And you can see that there's places where a lot of flow is likely to go through an area, but it's very diffuse and spread out. And then you also see places like the Appalachian chain where all sorts of movement and flow in, as populations change and move are gonna go through small areas. Now, we wanted to take this kind of technology that created this map and drive it down to a very fine scale that you could actually do conservation planning on. And so what we did is we took, we took the software that measures flow and we ran it through the resistance grid that I just showed you and we get this map of the east and on this map the dark blue areas are where tons of flow is predicted to go through. And that flow is the slow movement of populations over time in response to climate change. And we even split it out here between diffuse flow in blue, there's a lot of that in Vermont, and then highly channelized flow in orange, where 
plate with these are going to have a lot of things going through a very small area. So I just want to zoom in on this Vermont piece for you because I find it fascinating. Here we go. I added these green. I added these green arrows, but what you can see here is there's this flow line that goes up. Vermont's like this little crossroads where things move this way up into the Adirondacks, upward in the greens, or over into uh, Maine. You know, and really sort of that divergence in flow is running right through your state. Here's the national map, and just so you get some idea of this incredible diff diffuse flow in the west and all these channels of flow going in the central part of the country, and then that mixture in the, in the uh, east where we are. So now, hopefully, you're thinking, how do we keep resilient sites, and how do we maintain that flow pattern? And can we put those two things together to start to develop a network? And that's what we've done. But we added one more piece. If we wanted the network to really work, we wanted to make sure that it was full of high quality biodiversity now, you know, intact habitats, viable populations of species. And so we wanted to add that last piece in. So fortunately, that's, that's the piece that most of us have been working on for our careers, you know. Where are the intact habitats where? So we went back for this, we went back to the Nature Conservancy's eco-regional planning that came up with portfolios of sites for all the different eco-regions in the country. And those portfolios of sites were based on where the high quality communities were, natural communities, intact habitats, viable species populations. And then we also went to the states and we looked at, have the states done their own assessment you know, of where the quality communities are or the viable species population? And you know, the Vermont conservation design is, is a model of really terrific work you know, that has looked at those questions about where is diversity now? You know, where is the high quality diversity? And the cool thing is if you take the model design from the Vermont conservation design and you overlay it on the network that we've come up with, they sync up very nicely. The main difference really is our network is, is a subset. It's a little more precise than this. You can see that here. Um, and we can get into that. I'm just going to keep going. But for us, that means great. So Vermont has the opportunity of resilient sites, a lot of flow, and high quality diversity all matching up. I really wish I could say that to every state. But <laughs> that's why it's so fun to be here. <laughs> Here's the uh, Here's the map for the whole country of the high quality diversity sites, which we're calling recognized conservation value. And to get to this final network here, you know, it's really taking the resilient sites and prioritizing them if they have high quality diversity or if they're in the flow to match that up to create a network. And hopefully you can start to see how this network now, which is designed to have resilient areas with high quality diversity, but also to allow things to flow and move and find new sites, how this network could start to sustain diversity you know, over time as the climate changes. Here's what it looks like, a few things about it. One, it's, it's ambitious, it's a third of the country. In the east, it's about a quarter of the country, and then it's got more in the west. But it has resilient examples of all the physical habitats, all types of geology, soils, topography. It's all packed into there. And then it's got over 250,000 occurrences of known high quality biodiversity, intact habitats and species populations. And then it's arranged to sort of maximize that flow so that things will really be able to change and move if we, if we could actually conserve this all. So, can we actually conserve it all? I don't know. TNC cannot conserve that alone. I mean, we have a very impressive record. I'm proud of that record. We're nowhere near at this scale. This, this can only be done really by a collaborative effort of land trusts, conservation organizations, agencies really starting to work together to sort of commit to that. 
And here's a great uh, slide from the Land Trust Alliance rally in November where we first unveiled the map. And this is Andrew Bowman, the CEO, showing the map and challenging. There are a thousand land trusts in this, you know, challenging the land trust community. Can we actually start to collaborate to achieve a larger impact, you know, so we don't end up with a fragmented world? <clears throat> Now the other thing, and the important thing for me is, I know, you know, I'm an ecologist. <laughs> I love nature, I love intact habitats, but I know that that's not what the world is focused on right now. So the next thing we've done is we've started to calculate what are all the co-benefits of a network like this. <clears throat> so here's the network for the east. It, it measures exactly 23% of the landscape. But if you look at the carbon in this, it's 56% of all the above ground carbon in the east, you know, and more when you get into Vermont. Well, look, you know, so it's got a huge carbon impact for people. And as we'll talk about in a second, you know, conserving our existing forests or, or keeping forests as forests is one of the most, it's the cheapest, most cost effective way to get carbon out of the atmosphere. It's also got 75% of all the high value source water areas, you know, because most of our source water is actually in areas that are relatively intact and have lots of microclimates. So it's full of good, clean water. It provides oxygen for 1.8 billion people every year. It mitigates roughly 1.3 million tons of pollution, which has a huge benefit in health, you know, health cost savings. And it's got this number of, we're less sure of, you know, something around 25 billion in recreational, you know, potential, recreational economy. So when you start to look at these figures, you know, this is designed to have resilient areas that sustain wildlife, but it's also got incredible, you know, benefits for people if we could actually conserve this. Okay, so lastly, I just want to do a little bit of a deeper dive on carbon because I really think that carbon is the way that we're going to get to this kind of scale. Hardly on time? Okay. Okay, so. Every 10 years. Think about carbon. So let's start by just thinking about carbon. I know you, you know, you all learned about photosynthesis in elementary school. Yeah. And you probably get a little sick to your stomach when you hear the word. <laughs> but just think about it. So the leaves of a plant are full of chlorophyll. They extract carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. They split it and they release the oxygen and then they store the carbon as carbohydrates and sugars and build biomass out of that. We love that because we breathe the oxygen and then we eat the carbohydrates and sugars. So it's great for us. But this Carbon really puzzled scientists for a long time, and there's brand new science on it. Which, but think about it, back in the 1800s, the scientists were like, they had a pot full of dirt, you know, they'd weigh it, and then they'd put, some, they'd put a seed in it, and they'd let a little sapling grow for like two years. Then they'd take the sapling out, and they'd weigh the pot again, and the pot weighed exactly the same. And they were like, where did this tree come from? Because it didn't come out of the pot, you know? And eventually they realized, this must be coming out of the air, you know? And it took a while to figure out that that tree is coming out of the air. It's not coming out of the soil, you know? And after a while they realized, wow, there's, there's elements in the air that are being extracted. So when you see a forest outside, you know, it's easy to think that that forest came up out of the ground, but it didn't. It came out of the air. It's carbon that was in the air that is now materialized into, into wood and biomass, you know? And even the roots underground are coming out of the air and going, growing down. 
So that is the carbon storage, and that went on for so many years, you know, that eventually the atmosphere, our atmosphere, got, had much lower carbon, you know? And the whole fossil fuel thing is about, you know, coal is just old buried swamps that are being, you know, re-released back into the air, carbon that was stored and buried. Petroleum is old buried marine algae it's, that's compressed, you know? So, so there's nothing really like a forest for just extracting carbon. Now, what's really been clear, what's changed and become clear in the science is the importance of older trees. So for a while, we thought, starting in the 60s, we thought young, fast-growing trees must be collecting the most carbon because you can see it appearing, you know? But in fact, carbon, think about it, Carbon, how much carbon a forest is, has to do with how much leaf area there is, because that's where all the carbon is being extracted. So when you have a lot of leaf area, like in a tree like this, you know, or when you get a canopy with like understory structure, all that leaf area, it's all absorbing carbon and transferring it to a tree. And then you, instead of, instead of growing fast in growth rate, kind of like us, you know, after your growth rate slows down, it's, it's all volume. <laughs> so the trees are growing in volume, and that's where the biomass, you know, that's where the biomass is getting stored. So people thought, so people thought, wow, so now we, now we see there was a study done where they looked at 600,000 trees. They looked at all these studies that had already been done and they synthesized them together, 600,000 trees, and they saw, yeah, carbon, uh, carbon accumulation increases with age and tree size continuously. You know? And this, they had a great line in the, in the abstract, a single big tree can add the same amount of carbon to a forest within a year as it's contained in an entire medium-sized tree. You know? It's all that leaf area, so, so these intact, trees are just storing this carbon and we we want to keep them on the ground <laughs> because this is fast uh, okay but it's it's even it's even cooler so so now that we're so interested in carbon scientists have started to label the carbon as it gets absorbed and trace it to figure out where is all the carbon actually going and stored because that will help us figure out carbon storage so uh, in 2016, Tamara Klein labeled carbon in a bunch of trees, traced where it went, and the results of where that carbon went were amazing. So first of all, within a matter of hours you know, and days, much, most of that carbon had transferred to the roots. It had gone down. And what was even more amazing, you see this, <laughs> it was being shared with the other trees around it. So the carbon was being transferred to the roots and shared. Up to 40% of the carbon being absorbed by a single tree was actually being shared with the surrounding trees in the forest. Whoa. <laughs> and what was causing or what was facilitating that sharing was this intact mycorrhizal fungi network that you know you see when you kick up duff and you see all that white stringy stuff in the duct, that's the mycorrhizal fungal network. And that works with the roots to share carbon across the trees. And it's kind of a tricky thing because, or it's a, it's a good situation because the trees actually feed the mycorrhizal network. So another place the carbon was going was to feed all the underground fungi. And then the fungi helps it, helps trees extract nutrients. So they were getting nutrients and they were feeding that. So, Here's the carbon going, it's being shared among the trees. I won't go into detail, but I'll tell you one more thing. Because now, now the scientists are really all over this and they're trying to map it. This woman, Susan Seimart, has mapped it, you know, where the carbon goes. And what she found, she calls this largest trees in the forest, she calls mother trees. They're extracting most of the carbon, sharing it with the surrounding trees. And probably the coolest thing here, or the most surprising thing here, was that they are, uh, sorry. <laughs> the most surprising thing is that the mother trees 
are preferentially sharing carbon with their own offspring. So they're recognizing their own offspring and giving them a little extra sugar. <laughs> a familiar strategy from my point of view. Okay, so what's the result of this? I'll, I'll, I'll wrap this up. You know, the result of this is that we, we've now sort of very clear on the difference between sequestration and storage. Um, and just to make this clear to everyone, sequestration is the amount of carbon taken out of the atmosphere every year. You know? So as the forest becomes full of leaves and full of understory, at some point, you know, at some point this levels out because it, it's extracting all the carbon you can get from the light in that acre. And that and it does it annually. And that's you know, a lot of our forest management is about trying to get sequestration up, you know, so that we're getting sequestering. But that's different than storage because it accumulates over time in an intact forest. So every year it sequesters so much and then it stores it. And then over time you start having these massive carbon storage capacity in your forest. It's a lot like putting money in your bank account. You know, you, first you try and get your annual deposit up as high as you can, and then eventually you want to just keep it going over years to really build up. So our existing forests are these uh, huge sinks of carbon. And there's been great meta studies now done on this that show existing forests are big carbon sinks. You know. So what are the implications? You know, the, the big implications of this is the fastest, cheapest way to get carbon out of the atmosphere is to keep forests as forests, you know. And there's two, you know, as you know, there's two ways to do that, you know. The biggest one that we're investing in is forest management, improving uh, forest management so it's carbon friendly. And that, that can be delaying the harvest for a while. You know, that can be making sure we retain large trees, harvesting in clusters so you keep your fungal network fed, you know, so you don't want to, there's lots of strategies now about how to manage forests better, and our carbon market is based on the idea of better forest management for carbon. And we like this carbon market because you can also get money for doing this, you know. The other thing you can do is just let the forest grow, you know, you don't really even have to manage it, you just, let it uh, be a forest and it will store carbon for you. So conservation you know, at, at uh, that level is also great for carbon. And a friend of mine, Bronson Briscoe, really calculated how much of a difference can this really make, you know? So, well, first of all, what he meant, he looked at, so reforestation, which is not really applicable to Vermont, really. <laughs> you know, that's sort of the way we can get the most carbon, but that, that's putting forests, that's re, regrowing forests where there are no forests, you know. And that's great. The issue with that is it's slower. It takes a while for those trees to get up to where they're really storing carbon, and it's fairly expensive, you know. Avoiding forest conversion, that's the one that has huge potential. This is, this is low cost, this dark bar. That's the one, you know, just keeping forest as forest is the one that really has the highest potential for the cheapest cost. And then really improving our natural forest management also has very high potential um, and pretty low cost. So big strategies. And their estimate here, you know, in the next 10 years, if we really did that, we could we could meet about half of the carbon. We could store and sequester about half of the carbon needed to sort of stabilize the climate. I don't want to be too over optimistic because you'll see what happens is after a while, you know, if we don't get our other act together, <laughs> our policies and you know clean energy and all that that there's less of an ability for nature to actually store it but over the next 10 or 20 years nature can be half of the solution which is really mind-boggling works in works in grasslands too <laughs> all right so back to this you know in my mind this will likely, I don't really want it to boil down to the car. It's going to boil down, I think, conservation to 
conserving diversity, you know, changing that abundance crisis, reversing that abundance crisis, and storing the maximum amount of carbon, you know, and water for people. I think that's going to be our where uh, conservation really starts to focus. Um, but now I hope you can see how significant it is when I said this is 56% of the above ground carbon that the All right, I want to end with this. <laughs> I've sort of highlighted Vermont in a couple of different ways, and I just want to point it out because, you know, I work at a much larger scale in the state, but it's hard not to see the importance of Vermont when I look at all this. I'll start with, this is the carbon map uh, for the network. And this dark blue, this is the maximum amount of carbon. And I just want you to see that Vermont, parts of the Adirondacks, up here in more New Hampshire than Maine, really, you know, that is sort of the center of, of one of the carbon stocks in the east. So big, and that's from the existing forest that's already there. You know. um, also, so we talked about you know, it's got diverse limestone and a whole diversity, so it's got a rich diversity of physical properties, and it's got some of the most resilient areas uh, in the east for those uh, for those areas. And then it's got this incredible importance in terms of connectivity because it's in the middle, it's in the intersection of all these flows that are going to be happening, these terrestrial flows. And then lastly, it's not only resilient, but it's also got a terrific state plan already there, you know, that's really focused on the existing biodiversity. And to the extent that those things match up very nicely, you've got sort of the tools in place to really make a huge difference, you know, for people and nature in Vermont. You know, and last of all, you've got a community that values nature, which is about the most important ingredient <laughs> to the whole mix. So I'll stop there. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for a very thoughtful, eye-opening presentation. I'm sure there are a lot of questions, and I'll kick us off with one. Uh, uh, can you characterize something about, so Vermont's forests, what, where are we in the scale of uh, having sort of maximized our ability to serve as a carbon sink? Can you, does that, is it like a reservoir that fills and then that's it? Or, or can we keep on adding significant amounts of carbon even with the, with the forests we currently have? Great, I'll take a step and then I might pass it to Jim who has thought specifically about that question for Vermont. Uh, uh, the great thing about carbon, you, you max, it keeps, it keeps growing. So you can maximize your potential to sequester carbon every year so you can by, by restoring your forest and managing well, you can increase the amount that gets sequestered every year. But, but if you do that every year, year after year, it just keeps growing. So your accumulation just keeps growing and it, you're essentially doing the most that you can possibly do, but it doesn't stop, it just keeps growing. Does that, and Jim, do you have? Yeah, Jim Shallow, for the record, I'm a uh, conservation director at the Nature Conservancy here. And yes, you know, our forests, uh, Senator, are, are still in a young age. We have a, a kind of a medium age forest right now as they've recovered from past deforestation that went on in the state. And so there's a lot of room to grow there. As they get older, you know, those trees still, they're just starting to reach maturity, and so there's more room to grow. There's also studies out there that show that improved forest management could probably just add, you know, you know, 10 to 50 percent more carbon to that natural growth rate. So if things were done right, we focused on the right type of practices, we could kind of juice that a little bit more. Yeah, great. Uh, I've seen a couple of hands. Uh, so Senator McDonald, Senator Campion, then Senator Rogers. I'm, I'll, I'll, I haven't seen any hands move over here yet. So uh, you mentioned uh, reforestation. And yes. um, we have yet to have a discussion in the legislature about what's going to happen in the next 10 to 20 years as the ash trees die off and how it's going to affect our economy, foresters, et cetera. Do, is there time, should we have a reforestation policy in place of what to plant when the ash trees go before they just go? My answer is yes. I, I, I want to. I want to add, uh, toss that again to the Vermont team who knows the situation in the state. 
Yeah, uh, sorry, McDonald. Um, there, we should be thinking about reforestation in the right places. Um, whether or not we need to think about a, an aggressive reforestation around emerald ash borers, I think that's still an open question. I think we can address some of that through management. There is some study out there. The research has begun to show that um, the younger ash trees uh, are a little bit more resistant, or the, the bugs don't quite, quite aren't quite attracted to those. So they'll die last. Right, so, but there's also research that shows that denser uh, communities of ash are more resilient to the bugs as well. So I, I think there's a lot that we need to learn there. So I think it's more about the management, not necessarily thinking about we're going to have to go out and plant a lot of stuff. That said, we have a lot of opportunities where we do need to do reforestation, our riparian areas, uh, you know, that if we can do more reforestation in those sites, there'll be benefits there not only from carbon, but also from uh, improving the, the flow of our rivers and keeping floods from, you know, destroying our communities and everything. So yes, reforestation, but reforestation in places where we get maximum benefit for other values. And where's that being worked on today or tomorrow? Thank you. Right. Thank, well, you. thank you, Senator. That's, that's a very astute question, so I'm glad you're thinking about that. Senator Campion? I'd like you to say something about regenerative soil and agriculture for, for everyone. I mean, we've talked about this in the legislature. There are some farms, I know in my district and throughout the state, that are, are starting these no-till practices that also will sequester carbon. I'm wondering if you'd like to say a word and, and maybe even comment other parts of the country where people are seeing some success in this regard. Yeah, I'd love to. Let me put that, let me put this up, because that's sort of a mind-boggling picture here. And I, I'm a forest ecologist, Senator, so I'm not a grassland. But the, the revolutions in science about how forests extract and share carbon with their neighbors are equally true in grassland systems and in agriculture. And, you know, in our current agriculture practices, have not been really developed to store, to <coughs> essentially uh, uh, feed the microorganisms and the mycorrhizal and store carbon in the soil. But so that is an area where we have an opportunity to really increase carbon storage in soils. And no-till has become, you know, it's being demonstrated to be as productive, sometimes more productive as you know, till agriculture, and it, and it's seems to be really taking hold. So, okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Rogers? Uh, I'd just like to make a couple of points and then a uh, question. I'm sorry I didn't get here in time for the whole thing, but yeah. Senator McDonald's point about the ash, we have to be careful about just cutting all the ash because as with uh, beech and elm, trees do have a natural ability to adapt and hopefully will build resilience so we, we we've got to hope that the young ash do um adjust one of the things that you didn't talk about was private ownership and as a um, owner of a fair amount of, of private forest we just purchased a, a family farm that's been in our family from the early 1800s one of the biggest problems in vermont is the tax burden and the cost of carrying that farm and until Vermonters recognize and pay for the ecosystem services, you're going to see people continue to sell off pieces and develop that land because we can't afford to hang on to it. My tax bill is going to be $20,000 this year, um, which it's just most farmers and forest land owners cannot afford to keep it. So we as Vermonters have to develop a system. We've got the current use program, which I, I won't get too deeply into that, but you should not have to sign up for a government program to be taxed fairly on your property. And that's what we have to do now. Um, and then the other point I would like to make, and I'd like to comment about this, is as a, as a forester, um, we do harvest. I've got a harvest going on right now. Wood, the prices on wood are, are ridiculous. We were getting more for it 20 years ago. Um, but the one thing that you didn't mention was how if we do I know the big trees are grabbing more carbon and storing more carbon, but at some point we have to let the understory come. And if we sell those big trees for lumber for houses and, and um, nice lumber for furniture, then that carbon's also locked up. And I'd just like you to talk a little about proper management and locking that forest product yeah, up. Great. Well, and so thank you for that question, Senator. And 
I agree with your first two points strongly. So this is being worked on, you know, so wood products are part of the carbon solution because wood products are still carbon, you know, and if we can retain those products, there, there's some problems with losses, you know, in the along the way as it goes from a raw tree to a wood product, but if we can retain those products, that also keeps carbon on the landscape. You know? the, the old tree, I'm not sure of the answer to that question. This science that I just showed you is within the last five years, so it's very new science. I would say it looks like those old trees play a disproportionate role in, in in continuing to accumulate carbon at levels that the young replacement trees will take a long time to get to that same level. So I think there's probably some balance of when you want to make that shift, you know, and I think as we work as, you know, as the forest community really, the forest management community really works with that, that issue, I think we'll start to figure out where that balance is, you know. Well, and I think, as I said before, I think if people were paid for their ecosystem services, they may be able to do that. But currently, because of the cost of holding that forest land, we're all looking at, at the bottom line, and we have to cut that wood to be able to hang on right. to the woodland. Um, and then the, the one other point that I find very interesting is um, supposedly with some of this new research, they're saying that mycelium actually allows the trees to communicate. Yeah, extremely interesting. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I didn't go there. That is fascinating. That is fascinating research about how trees are actually communicating with each other. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, the I had wanted to talk about this. You've laid out a lot of natural challenges for us to be looking at. How about climate in terms of? population uh, movement. I mean, one of the things that's come up but we haven't talked about much as, um, is if, there, if climate change is as severe as it's forecast to be and oceans rise and coastal populations move, um, are you looking at how people may move and what kind of impact and pressures that will bring to places like Vermont and the rest of New England? That's a great question. We had an interesting discussion of that last night. And I, I also will fund it. I'll, I'll, I'll give a, you know, the sea level rise issues are really big. And, and right now, they look sort of intractable. There are, you know, there are communities out there along the coast that are, there's some air, energy, uh, places in Alabama where they have hundreds of thousands of repetitive flooding claims that are not getting filled, you know, they're just, they're getting flooded every year, sometimes every month, and they're putting claims, but eventually, they're gonna have to move, you know, so it's really how long can our coastal communities exist before we start to back away? And can we actually do it in some sort of planned way? The movement to Vermont, I don't know enough about. I, I, my only thought is there's a lot of people that that 50 below winters have scared away from Vermont. And I don't know if you had, doesn't think you had that this year. And if it's going to get warmer and more attractive, that might start bringing people on for you. Any of the Vermont staff <laughs> thought about this? Yeah, I, I mean, I have, to, I have kind of two thoughts about this. I mean, just like your model, <laughs> Is, it's dynamic, dependent on where we're able to conserve land and see species move over time. In the same way, you, you presented on resistance as well, the, the kind of resistant features of the landscape. And those resistant features are going to impact where we're able to conserve land. And as people move, those resistant places are going to shift as well. So that's kind of my first thought. And then my second thought is that we've, we have People who are now, I mean, I know, I know people personally who have moved here to say, we're moving away from the coast, we're moving away from fires, we don't want to be in Florida to experience what's happening there. And so we're starting to see that shift happening. And we need to take that into account as we're planning for uh, protecting this, this resilient system. Right. I mean, we, right now, we, we're always hearing about Vermont's challenging demographics and that we're barely sort of holding our own in population. But if you, there's a great report, the Castle Report back in 1987. If you look in that, it looks at the 20 years prior and 125,000 people moved to Vermont. So 
it's conceivable that we'd have a large population swing in a 20-year period again. So, Representative Shell. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. This is incredibly edifying, and I appreciate your work. I'm um, wondering about your model and how much of it is driven by kind of current land use practices. And so the species migration routes that you identify, are they just an anachronism of, uh, of what we've left for species to use, or are they actually what species might be using if there were other habitats available? And related to that, how does your plan identify underrepresented, underrepresented types of habitat that we also need to be protecting? Oh, great question, thank you for that. Uh, to a large extent, the movement models are a reflection of how we've already built out the landscape and what is left for nature to move through. Mixed, mixed with climatic gradients that are going to be important for nature. And those climatic gradients are more topographically based. So it's a mixture of those two, but it's mostly how we've already built it out. Um, the underrepresented settings <coughs> uh, is part of the, you know, is part of the analysis, and certainly some of the richest settings, like limestone regions, you know, are the least protected because they are some of our best farmlands, you know. So conservation is very, if you look at how conservation is distributed across the physical world, it's very much targeted on very poor soils and high elevations and things that were really not that uh, beneficial for people. So trying to balance more representation of other settings is also going to be sort of tricky and expensive work, I think. Representative McCullough. So, Doctor, you, you're likely are aware, and, I, and, I, and I'm very sure our Vermont Contingent Conservancy is aware that in Act 250, we've got the language uh, around forest blocks protection and connectivity protection. And and what what I what I think I pull from your major connectivity common denominator through the whole theme here is that while we have in our legislation connectivity for wildlife to get from um, perhaps uh, Chittenden County to Franklin County, um, or from one side of Route 100 to the other, the forest blocks themselves as a greater area serve as connectivity. Um, and and, and uh, is, would you say that is accurate? Yeah. Yes, no. that is very astute comment. So you clearly got the message that that is, I think, the, the message of the need under, under climate change for those forest blocks to allow many other things to be moving and have those dynamics. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that act and question. Um, we have up in Burlington uh, at UVM the Gun Institute, and for a decade, it's been at least a decade since they first came into the building and presented a model of payments related to ecosystem services. So a decade ago, it was more along the, the co-benefits you were talking about, clean air, clean water. Um, but lately, because of climate, I think you know people are much, uh, carbons come to the fore. Are, so I'm wondering if you've seen successful models. So even though there was a good case made, people understood it, um, because we've been getting it for free, in essence, I don't, if people have not yet latched on to saying, oh, we're gonna pay for something we've been quote unquote getting for free. Have you seen models of ecosystem services uh, succeed uh, in any jurisdictions? Well, you know, we've certainly seen an explosion of the carbon markets, you know, that has probably powered uh, 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 an explosion in land management and protection in the last five or ten years, you know. So those carbon markets are set up in a way that you can, if you change your management practices so that you store more carbon than you would have in your existing practice, you can receive payments for that money. And that has really been very powerful. 
Um, Phil, do you? Well, yeah. I'd love to add something too, but I wonder if Jim, do you want to add anything more on the forest carbon market side of things? Yeah, I, you have a report that a summer study uh, created um, addressing this very issue about how um, our forests play a role in carbon sequestration and storage and the opportunities that are out there for using payment for ecosystem services to help out forest landowners like Senator Rogers to get paid for the carbon they're storing. I encourage all of you to take a look at that report. Uh, there's a companion bill that's been introduced that's in your committee right now, S-280. Uh, I know you're, um, Senator, you've been looking at trying to get some folks in to talk about that. I um, urge you to get the members of that committee in and we can give you the full education on how we can use carbon as a payment for ecosystem services because it is, the one market that is the most mature in this country for paying people for that ecosystem services. California has proven that this works. The voluntary markets are proving that it works. Worldwide, it's working. So if you want to get on the game and play in carbon for ecosystem services, it's laid out for you there. It's ready to go. Question is ready. All right, well, we'll be seeing you next week, I think. <laughs> Could I, could I just add a follow-on to that? Or, uh, sure, please. Uh, the payment for ecosystem services, if that would be helpful. Uh, Phil Huffman, uh, Director of Government Relations and Policy for the Nature Conservancy here in Vermont. Um, so I wanted just to touch um, on the agricultural side of things um, and payment for ecosystem services work that's ongoing here in Vermont. Um, as some of you may know, there was another study group that was authorized by the legislature last spring to look into creating a, a payment for ecosystem services framework, particularly for the agricultural sector. Um, that's been led by the Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets. Deputy Secretary Allison Eastman has been chairing that. Um, uh, the House of Conservation Board, Nancy Everhart, Vice Chair. That work, that group has done great work over the course of the fall into early winter. It came out with a report a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's really complicated. Uh, there are not um, established markets uh, to the same degree that there are for forest carbon yet in the agricultural side of things, but I think there's a lot of um, a lot of opportunity and well worth exploring. Um, we've been uh, a part of that conversation. We, the Nature Conservancy, we're here to continue to be a part of it with a whole host of other players from the agricultural community, the agency, farmers, other interests. Um, the focus of that group um, at, to this point, and I think it's pretty stable going forward, is to look at soil health as sort of the umbrella um, with, that provides a number of different ecosystem services, so carbon absorption being one of those, but also increased productivity for the agricultural products that uh, the ag lands are focused on, um, improved infiltration of water to help slow down uh, flooding, uh, other sorts of benefits like that. If there's improved biological diversity in the soil if you're managing more for soil health and some of the things that Mark already touched on. So the, the trick is figuring out where the revenue sources uh, may come from to help to support that sort of a system, but it's something that we're, I think there's a lot of hope, at least we'll see. Big things still to figure out. There is also a lot of work that's going on on this. Uh, nationally and really around the world. It's a nut that a lot of people are trying to figure out how to crack, and our hope is that we can bring in some of that uh, learning uh, from other parts of the, the country and the world to help inform what we're doing here at Vermont, and also potentially help to provide some learning from here that can inform efforts elsewhere. Well, I hope that we find our way forward to start treating soil as a calling it and recognize it as an ecosystem. Uh, Senator Rogers, do you have a follow-up uh, on, on this or? No, go ahead, Thank you. Senator Joel. Good morning. I have a, a two separate questions. My first question is in regards to your list of, of co-benefits, and I appreciate that. I think it's important for us to, to recognize when we, we try to, when we make investments to maximize those co-benefits. But in recognition of a state that actually receives a significant amount of impact related to our, our climate crisis in the form of extreme weather, we, uh, we see, for example, anywhere in Vermont we experience a, a flood of a significant magnitude somewhere in the state. And so the role of, of one co-benefit you, I don't think you identify, but is I think real and I would appreciate your comment on it, is the importance of forests and the healthy, uh, the health of our forest soils 
and being able to hold water. We often think of, for flood resilience, we think of just the floodplain or the river corridor, when in fact the health of that watershed to retain and absorb that water is critical because otherwise if you channelize all that rain right into the receiving water, hence you get flooding in the valley bottoms. Um, so I appreciate you identifying or commenting on that because I noticed that it wasn't necessarily identified in your list. And I'll go to my second question after that. Well, first of all, thank you for bringing that up. So you said it very well yourself. You know, forests, you know, they intercept water and then it sort of goes slowly down the trunks and into the soil and then the soil becomes a storage source that releases water slowly over time and really helps mitigate flooding. The only reason we don't have it up there is we just haven't figured out how to measure that and put a number to it yet. But I think that's a really critical service, so thank you. Okay, and it's a point that I know our commissioner at Forest Parks and Rec Recreation often mentions is the, the role of forests in flood mitigation. Uh, my second point is uh, to follow up from Senator Rogers' comment in recognition that 80% of our, more or less, uh, Vermont is privately owned and that when people have in, in part of their livelihood investment in forests, I would argue that a, a healthy, well-managed forest, it holds more carbon, even though you're actively managing it, than a land that has com converted into a sub-development, for example. And, uh, and so because of the, that number of, of lands in private um, ownership, some of which, and um, much of which are managed actively. Um, really interested to hear about the opportunity for greater education with this information. And in, the, in, and in particular, how do we integrate, or are we, and how can we help facilitate the integration of this inf information into forest management plans so that we can help maximize the values you just described while at the same time recognize that um, forests, healthy forests, managed forests can also um, in, be enhanced to, to uh, provide for multiple benefits. <laughs> well, that is a great question. So in fact, I think our whole strategy, you know, our whole strategy for how we want to roll this out is really about how do we how do we find channels for getting this information out in a way that can be taken up and by uh, organizations, agencies, individuals, and integrated into their own planning, so that so that you know forest management, which is already improving, you know, can continue to improve so that we can really start to get our management completely synced up with the science and storing the carbon. How can we get our children to be learning about these services so that they're thinking about it? So I don't have the answer to that, but I think you hit on exactly the challenge ahead is how do we actually feed this out in a way that it can be taken up and used for you know, better planning. I don't see any more. Oh, I do see more. <laughs> Senator Rogers and Senator McDonald. I could talk about this subject all day. Great. It's something that I'm very passionate about. And I, I just want to hit on a, a few things that I don't think we've talked about unless I missed them before they came in. Uh, number one is invasive species, which both invasive plants and animals with the ash borer, for instance, are, are greatly affecting our uh, forests and grasslands, uh, wetlands, everything is being impacted by invasives, even the water, even under the water. Um, population growth, and that's something I think too few people talk about, is worldwide population growth, and I personally think there's too many people on this rock. And so when we talk about bringing more people to Vermont, it, you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Do we want more people in Vermont? If we have more people, we have more housing, we have more subdivisions, we have more forest tracks broken up, and connectivity is lost, and in my personal opinion is that we should be working on uh, sustainable um, environment and, and sustainable economy and, and, and that's something that no industrialized nation has ever done. They always build everything on a pyramid scheme of growth, right? right. And so what is it when you figure all this and how much force we need to add to store the carbon that we need to store
store is it taken into account the dramatic increase in population around the world, which is driving much of the carbon being produced. Um, and then my last point is that the one thing that frustrates me very much with the carbon market is we have a whole bunch of folks out there who don't want to change their lifestyle because they have the money to write out a check. And just because you're writing out a check to the carbon market does not mean you're doing the earth good. If you're still jumping on an airplane every week and flying here and flying there, your check cannot make up for the damage you're doing uh, in, in producing carbon. <laughs> I'm not sure those are questions. <laughs> I mean, I would, the way I would answer that, I mean, the, Vermont alone, you know, can't get us anywhere near where we have to get. And you're right, it is a global problem. And the same activities we're talking about here, you know, need to be replicated in other countries. You know, how we make that, I, I'd say the one thing I have to believe is if we can do it here, you know, then hopefully that'll start, rather than say, well, we're not going to do it because nobody else is, you know, if we can start solving these problems here, you know, hopefully we can start building that network that will expand globally. But you are right, they, it is, these are global issues. Um, welcome to the Senate Natural Resources <laughs> Uh, Senator Rogers and I are in an ongoing contest to talk all day. <laughs> but this being the weekend of uh, the Tet Offensive, um, I thought we had declared the truce. Um, I have a question. Uh, last witness, uh, uh, um, Representative Dolan, we talked about uh, water treatment, et cetera, et cetera. And we hear people talking about forests and carbon sequestration. and we got two scientific groups that are lobbying together, but they never come in and lobby together for a precious resource. Does the thing that representatives talked about, or you talked about, do they either do both those things? Do they complement one another? And are you getting two things for the same money if you choose to spend money in those two areas? Carbon and water set. Yes, as the representative uh, pointed out, you know, conserving forests that store carbon is also an incredibly good prospect for storing water and filtering, you know, filtering water so you get cleaner water, water is stored and then released to help prevent flooding. So forests and fresh water, you know, in Alaska, you know, they call their forests salmon forests because salmon depends so much on intact forests. It's a great analogy of just those two things are so interconnected that they shouldn't even be lobbying separately, really. Thank you. You mean um, if they're lobbying separately, they're, this isn't a scientific question anymore, <laughs> they, I'm asking you to comment on political activity. <laughs> They should be lobbying together. In my opinion, they should be lobbying together. We're going to buy them some handcuffs. <laughs> so, thank you. And one of my favorite John Muir quotes is that when you tug on anything in nature, you find it hitched to the rest of the universe. Um, today, Why you've made it clear, <laughs> clearer, just how what some of those connections are. So, before we move on to the program, I'd like to uh, recognize Dr. Anderson for his work and. Uh, Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, now, we'd like to uh, invite Phil Huffman from Nature Conservancy for Vermont. Right, well, just to wrap up, uh, we want to thank you all. Uh,
Chair Bray, Chair Sheldon, the members of the committee, and for all of you who are able to be here today for the opportunity to share Mark's work and, it's, and Mark and his team's work, I think, as he acknowledged early on, it's a whole host of folks, some of whom are in this room, in fact, who've been involved in helping with this science, uh, partners, close colleagues of ours. Uh, from neighboring organizations as well as from uh, inside TNC. I uh, hope that this has been helpful, informative, interesting, uh, and food for thought on a lot of different fronts. I wanted to just touch on a, on a couple of things. We've, we've gotten into a lot of things already that I think tie right into policy issues and initiatives and whatnot that are in front of your committees and other ones in this building that the administration is working on. Uh, and that we and our partners uh, in the, in the non-governmental sector are working on as well. I just wanted to try to tie a few things together very quickly uh, before we wrap up. Uh, I think, you know, first and foremost, that. Uh, one of, one of the key messages, obviously, from what Mark has said, is about the importance of keeping forests as, as forests, um, and wetlands as wetlands, and natural systems as natural systems, for to help nature adapt and respond to the change that's already happening so rapidly, but also to help all of us. Um, as individuals, our communities, as a state, to respond to the climate change that's already underway. We need to sustain our natural systems for the benefits that they provide for all of us. We depend on them. Uh, we can look at this body of science, and as it intertwines so closely, as Mark was indicating, with uh, Vermont conservation design, but look at it as, look at it as a um, sort of a uh, blueprint um, for where and how we focus our investments in conservation. Uh, so as Mark, I think, touched on, the resilient and connected network for the Northeast is about 23% of the land area. So you can sort of translate that down to Vermont. It's a, that's a significant area. A bunch of it, the good news is, a bunch of that's already conserved in public lands, federal, state, municipal, um, and also by nonprofits, private organizations, and whatnot. So it's not we're not starting from zero and needing to get to 23 to conserve the whole resilient connected network, but we have a lot of room to grow on there. So we need to be thinking about how we can use this science to help inform how we're uh, targeting our conservation investments. Um, and this ties back to the conversation that many of us were a part of yesterday with uh, Vermont Housing Conservation Board investments on the conservation side. Uh, it ties into land use planning and regulation, the Act 250 dialogue, trying, as Representative McCullough was pointing out, about the uh, provisions that are uh, under consideration to help sustain uh, forest blocks and landscape connectors um, for the critical value that those provide for nature, but also, again, all the benefits that will provide for people. Uh, also, the importance of providing strong protection for riparian corridors and wetlands, other things that are under consideration of the intertwined with not only Act 250, but also land use regulation and planning at the local level and regional level of work that our partners uh, from ANR and others are working on so much with our communities and our and regional planning commissions around the state. Uh, <clears throat> forest management, obviously a really important part of all of this, a great opportunity. Uh, it intertwines with the forest carbon market potential, uh, opportunities to secure revenues for forest landowners to help them keep their lands as forests, which I think the vast majority of forest landowners in this state want to do. Um, and it's a challenge. It's just a, trying to figure out how to help them deal with the financial challenges that Senator Rogers was pointing to. Uh, there are ways that this all intertwines, um, and the science can help inform where and how we're going about that. Uh, the importance of reforestation, uh, less of an opportunity for that here in Vermont than there is in other places that have uh, taken out more of their forest than we have. Uh, unfortunately, we're nearly 80% forested here in Vermont. But there are targeted areas. Mark mentioned riparian corridors in particular. That's a place where the floodplain forests of Vermont that used to be uh, prevalent are pretty limited at this point, And they provide tremendous values for nature and for people in all sorts of ways with water quality protection, uh, and reduce vulnerability from flooding, things like that. So we should be looking for targeted opportunities for forest restoration. Um, there's the whole soil health and payment for ecosystem services uh, potential in the ag sector there as well that I touched on a few minutes ago. Uh, so those are, oh, and then I guess one other one that I wanted to mention that um, was uh, a point that Mark touched on in one of his first slides. Um, 
And I think the one about the abundance crisis and about, if you remember, there was the, the graph showing most uh, sort of groups of species have declined significantly. The one where there's been some good news is around forest, uh, sorry, wetland birds. Um, and that, the reason that that's better than it might be is in part, as Mark said, um, both because of that practices restraining the harvesting of weapon dependent birds, but it's also very much about the uh, strength and regulation, protection and regulation of wetland systems uh, around the country that has happened. And this is obviously ties right into policy dialogue that many of you have been a part of. Uh, that again came out of the last legislative session about what should we be doing around here in Vermont around our wetland statute and regulations. And I think the message from Mark's work in part is that we need to be doing everything we can to maintain strong protections for our existing wetlands and be doing everything that we can to try to accelerate the restoration of degraded wetlands, uh, which we have lots of around the state. So those are, uh, the, 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 there's probably more. Those are the ones that I'm you know, sort of scribbling down in my notes as the conversation was unfolding. I hope those resonate. Um, and I think I'll, I'll leave it there, but again, we want to thank you all for the opportunity to share this body of work um, <laughs> with you all. Hope it helps to inform your understanding and your thinking as you go forward in the policy dialogue. And we at the Age of Conservancy really look forward to continuing to work with you on it. So, thanks very much. <laughs>